And now we're going to go back to the book of Romans and continue our study. And what I would like to do tonight, I don't think, is really a, a deep dive. I'm not really taking some doctrine that's, uh, you know, tertiary or secondary and diving into something that's deep. What I would like to remind us as we get back into Romans, we're going to read some verses here, is the purpose for which the book is written. And, and, and the, the, that purpose for which the book is written is really foundational to us. It should be the first thing that we understand. We shouldn't move forward into doctrinal matters unless we get this issue settled. So that issue is what we're going to cover even though I haven't called it out by name. Romans chapter number 1, let's read a few verses together and we're going to pick up. Romans chapter 1, let's begin in verse 11. Romans 1.11 Romans 1.11, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles." I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now we've covered everything up there to, to verse number 16. So I hope as we read through those verses that there were some thoughts that came back to your mind on some of those words and, and the phrases there. I want to draw your attention back to verse number 11 where Paul says that he longs to see them that he might impart unto them some spiritual gift. Now the, the purpose, the purpose of the book of Romans is to establish us in sound doctrine. We've already talked about where Romans shows up in your, in your Bible and how you now have the Apostle Paul who's been sent out with information from the resurrected and ascended Lord Jesus Christ. And so the very first letter that we get from, from Paul is the book of Romans. There's been a change of program from Israel under the law, right? It is, it, is it not undeniable when you look back at Israel's program? How was it that, what is it that God gave to Israel through Moses? He gave them the law. So before that, prior to that, through Abraham, he gave them circumcision. Neither one of those were op optional for Israel. It wasn't like, you know, you know, do it if you feel like it, you know, or do your best, no. You had to be circumcised, and you had to keep the law. Now, of course, no man could keep the law, so what is there in the law? There's a provision, a sacrificial provision for when you transgress the law, that a sacrifice is offered, and it covers your sin. But my point being is that now we come to a point in time where God has chosen the Apostle Paul to send him out and preach a gospel where it is not under law, and it is not under circumcision. It's the gospel of the uncircumcision. Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. And so people are, what is, what is the first thing if God is going to communicate something to you as a lost, sinful human being, what is the first thing that you need to know? Anybody want to raise a hand? David. That there is a solution. There's a solution to your problem. That I am a man, I have sinned, and no matter how much I try to scrub myself to get rid of this sin, I cannot do it. Because once you sin, once you have one sin on your account, there's nothing that you can do to go back and cleanse you from that sin. Even if you lived a perfect life from this day, from this minute forward, which by the way, we cannot do. 
But even if you lived a, a, a perfect life from this point forward, you still have the sins of your past that needs to be dealt with. And so the first thing that God deals with or, through Paul in the book of Romans is the issue of salvation. Your justification. How is it that you and I as sinners can be right before God? And then, what is the next thing that we would need to know after we get justification? So now that I know how to be right with God, that He's communicated a gospel to me, the next question is, how should we then live? Okay, God, thank you for saving me from my sin. Now, if all He did was told you, here's the gospel, and you believe this, and then you left and went your own way, and then you're left, what do I, what do, I do now? How do I live my life now that you've saved me from my sin? And so the way that Romans is set up is chapters 1 through 5 is going to deal with your justification, with your salvation. And once Paul establishes your justification and your salvation, he's going to move forward into chapters 6 through 8 and tell, us, and tell you how you now live. How is it that we should now live? Then in, in chapters uh, 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 9 through, through 12, or uh, there's, the, there's the dispensational issue that goes on in, in 9 and 10 and 11. And so what we see, what I wanted to point out is that Paul is not scatterbrained. As an accountant, I, I have like a thousand, multiple thousands of numbers that go through my head every day. And there's some times where I'm scatterbrained. And I start to communicate something and it's so scattered and I'm like, wait, let me start again. And I, I, you know, but this is not how Paul approaches Romans. Paul approaches Romans very logically. We're going to first lay the foundation. And now after you know this, this is what you need to know. And then after you know how to live, you're going to get objections from the Jews about why the program has changed. So now I'm going to give you the dispensational information. And then after that, you know, you have Romans 12 through 16. There's the, the, there's the information about the practical nature of how that doctrine works out in your life, right? Thanks for correcting me on that, George, with the 9 through 11, and then 12 through 16. So Romans establishes those issues for you. Paul may not have been able to come to them physically. He says that I, I desire to come unto you. And so he wasn't able to come to them, look them face to face, and deliver this information to them. But he was able to write this letter. And I half wonder if he wasn't able to get there to do it face to face because God wanted him to write the letter so that way you and I could read the letter. Now, <clears throat> when you build something, what is the most important part of the structure? If you go to build a house, what's the most important part? The foundation. So when I say that Paul starts off in chapters 1 through 5 by telling you about your justification, this is the foundation. You can't build anything about how to live your Christian life, about how to walk in the Spirit, about how to present your bodies a living sacrifice. You can't do anything like that until you first know that you're right with God, that you've been justified, that you know what the gospel is. And so when you build a foundation, what does it do to the structure that you build upon it? It stabilizes it. Thank you, stability. George nailed it before, and I didn't even give you guys a cheat sheet to study for the pop quiz. <laughs> George is on point. It really stabilizes the structure. If you don't have a foundation and you just tried to put the walls up, a lot of you would know better than I would. If you just put some walls and you don't have any foundation for it, it's going to be wobbly and it's just going to fall over, right? The first sign of wind that comes along and it catches that wall and it's just going to push the structure over. Likewise, we as Christians need a solid foundation. We need to understand what is the most important things. We need to get those things right before we move on in doctrinal matters. You know, before you want to learn the, 
issue, the issue of the, you know, the substitutionary atonement or, the, or, or transubstantiation where they talk about you know, the communion and what happens with the wine. You know, before you start to try to be an expert in those doctrines to try to disprove something or try to prove something, the first thing that you need to do is you need to get your salvation right. You need to get the gospel right. So God is interested today when Paul says in verse number 11 that he wants to come unto them to impart some spiritual gift. And what does he say right after that? He wants to impart unto them some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. So Paul tells you what the gift is. The gift is doctrine. The gift is God's word, the truth that will establish you. Because guess what? Spiritual gifts, like that were given to substantiate the message that was being preached, right? Like speaking in tongues and things like that, which is a, 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 a different language. Those things are not going to be what establishes the believer. That's not going to be it. It is the gift of doctrine. So, uh, the, the simple things that are dealt with in Romans, salvation, justification, sin, flesh, law versus grace, your walk, Israel, the body of Christ. These are simple basic things that we need to understand. And the, these distinctives that we have for us in the dispensation of grace in the body of Christ is expounded upon for the first time in the book of Romans. Now what I mean by that is, you know, this is one of the distinctives for Grace Bible Church. You know, we make no qualms about it. We're a dispensational Bible church. And what that means is we understand that God has worked in different ways at different times. When God instituted the Levitical priesthood for Israel, He's no longer doing that. The book of Deuteronomy, which tells Israel about the law, He's not doing that today. Now, does that mean God was wrong in doing it, that God messed up? No, that's, that's not it. But God has had worked out differently in human history in different ways at different times. And, and the issue of the gospel of your justification is expounded upon for the first time in the book of Romans to tell you about the good news of the cross. Because when Peter preached the cross in the book of Acts, did he preach it as good news or bad news? He preached it as bad news that you have crucified your Messiah. He didn't tell them that, hey, good news, Christ died on the cross for your sins. And now you can be saved simply by believing. He said that you have crucified your Messiah, and you now need to repent and be water baptized for the remission of sins. And the men were pricked at their heart. Why were they pricked at their heart? Because they were condemned by Peter's preaching of what they had done on the cross. That was bad news for them. So Romans is important. Romans tells us about the clarity of the gospel, the issue of him saving individuals on the basis of grace alone, through faith alone, through the shed blood of Christ alone, and that after this dispensation is over, he will return to Israel. That's chapters 9 through 11. And we'll get there. But you understand we don't get there until we get through chapters 1 through 5 and get justification right. Now, some of the new versions, uh, the new Bible versions there in, in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 11, instead of gift, what they do is they add an S at the end of that word. And they add an S there and they make it gifts, plural. And I think that that detracts from the true gift, which is edification. Paul is not talking about multiple gifts. He's not talking about the sign gifts that were given over, that, are, that is discussed in the book of Corinthians. He's talking about the gift. And so you need to be careful which translation you use because different translations were translated from different source texts. And find out which of those source texts is right and get the proper translation from the proper source text. If two things say things that are contrary, they both can't be true at the same time, right? So the first time uh, that issue of establishment is talked about where Paul says, I want to establish you, the first time that is mentioned is back over in Genesis chapter number 6 where he, he tells Noah to build a boat and he says, I'm going to establish my covenant with you. Now get in the boat 
So it's interesting, the first time that word established, established is brought up, is brought up where God is going to save Noah and his family. And now Paul brings it up in Romans in the context of how he's going to save you and I in the body of Christ. That doctrine. So he establishes an agreement with Noah and he establishes an agreement with us. And just to be clear, when he talks about establishment, think of that issue of the foundation being laid. That if you're not established, you're not going to have the firm foundation, you're going to be like that house. And when someone comes along and questions your faith, then the wind blows. And what happens to the house? It collapses. My prayer for you is that you would be rooted in your faith. My prayer for you is that you would understand enough about the truth of the gospel of your salvation that when people come along and will say something and try to move you off of that truth and cause you to doubt it, that you will say, I know enough. You know, like I, I may not be a very smart man, but I know that I'm saved by grace through faith alone. Don't tell me that I have to work in order to earn my salvation. So know truth enough to that when the error comes by, you have a litmus test. You know, they used to talk about when they wanted presidents and what's your litmus test for appointing a Supreme Court justice? <laughs> you know, what is your standard by which you are going to evaluate things? Our standard by which we should evaluate things is, is this salvation by grace alone through faith alone, or are they mixing law and works in with it? And if they are, then we reject it. Now, as we get into the book of Romans and we, we break it down, I said that the, the main point of chapters 1 through 5 is that a man is justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Christ alone. And a very important word for you to know is that you want to know that word alone. <laughs> You're, you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, through the finished work of Christ alone. What Christ did on the cross does not need to be augmented or supplemented by what you and I do. We don't need to take some vitamin D supplements to make our salvation sure and make sure that we're able to survive until the end and that we don't lose it. What Christ did is either sufficient or it's not. And if you want to take the position that the cross work of Christ is not sufficient, fine, you do so at your own peril. But you're going to have a very hard time from Scripture trying to say that the cross work of Christ was not sufficient. It is very sufficient. He was God in the flesh. And He loved you enough to die for you. And the power of His love is strong. Once you get through that, that part of Romans, chapters 1 through 5, then we move on to the saving us from the religion and the denominations and those who make a, uh, you know, a fair show in the flesh. And at, at Grace Bible Church, you know, I often say those three words, they can sound generic, right? Grace Bible Church. But they do have a lot of meaning, do they not? What's the per most important thing for you to know? That your salvation is by grace alone. Where do we go today to get truth? The Bible. And what are we? We're the church, the body of Christ. We should gather together as a local assembly. This is the manifestation of God working out through us is when we meet together. So it's extremely important. The, the primary issue here is the issue of the gospel and the... And the and, and, and so other issues are, can be extremely important. But everything is secondary to the gospel and your salvation. If, if your security, the security of your salvation, rests in Christ, then how, how, what that will do when you live your life is you can live your life in peace. When you know that your security rests in Christ and not yourself, I say this because of my personal experience and my background, thinking that I wasn't good enough and I constantly had to perform and be better, 
and tell God all of my sins and try to repent of them and say, God, I'm really sorry. Can you please wipe the slate clean and I'll try better tomorrow? Never feeling sufficient enough. But when you come to the point where you know that your security rests in Christ, then you can live your life in peace knowing that Christ is perfect and nothing can undo what Christ has done. That's Romans chapter 8, right? But if you believe your security rests on what you do, oh, woe is you. You will have no peace in life. You will go through life like a hamster on a rat, reel, rat wheel. And, and Well, is it a hamster wheel or a rat wheel if it's a hamster? It, <laughs> no, no, it's A or B. Yeah. There's going to be no peace for you in that thinking process. And that would be the result of you not being established in Romans 1 through 5. That would be the result of you coming back over here and looking about what's going on back here. If you get this one doctrinal issue right, it'll save you from a lot of trouble in other doctrinal areas as you go forward, right? If you don't get salvation right, and then you start living your Christian life, and people want to start talking to you about doctrine at work, or, or, or you know, at, the, at the supermarket, or wherever you may be, and someone says, well, you know, what about the prodigal son? He was lost before he was found, you know? He, he returned. What, couldn't, couldn't the, wasn't he a son to begin with? Yes, he was a son. And then he became lost after he was a son. Maybe you can lose your salvation. You know, over in, uh, over in James, it tells you that, you know, you, you need to, to work. And I'll show you my salvation by my fruit of my labor. So if you get this one doctrinal issue right, it's going to save you a lot of confusion later on. The debate over your justification for, is someone saved? Do they produce, they come out and they say, well... Do they have good fruit in their life? You know, the Bible talks about producing spiritual fruit. As a believer, we should produce spiritual fruit. We should not be barren. Christ came and looked at the fig tree, and what did he say? It's bare. Let's, let's cut it down. Um, and that led to Israel being cut off because they didn't produce fruit. They didn't believe in their Messiah. But do they have to produce fruit in their life in order to be saved? Should we be looking for fruit is the litmus test for whether or not someone is saved, whether or not their tree produces fruit. When you go through and we study Romans 1 through 5, I just want you to think in the back of your mind, does Paul ever say anywhere that you're saved by grace through faith alone, and then after you are saved out of necessity, then you will bring forth fruit? You see, there are no conditions. There are no strings attached to your salvation. There's nothing that God says, here, I'm going to give you life, but I'm going to hang this over your head that if you do something wrong, I'm going to take it back from you. God's not a tyrant. God's a loving God. And He knows that we're unable to perform. He knows that in our flesh dwelleth no good thing. That's why he wrote it in his book. And so he doesn't hang this over our head to say, I'm just waiting for you to mess up so I can take that life back from you. <laughs> no, we don't look for fruit. We understand that salvation is based solely on what Christ did. And what we look for is what are you trusting so if we want to know if someone is saved, we say, are you saved? And if they say yes, we say, how do you know? And what we're looking to hear is that Christ died for my sins. But all too often, what do you hear in culture today? Well, you know, I went to church. I've gone to church my whole life. Well, you know, uh, my parents, they were good Catholics. <laughs> That's a double negative. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, you know, I got baptized. I got this certificate of baptism, you know, when I was eight years old. I went to the vacation Bible school at the local Baptist church and got baptized. None of those answers is what Paul says in Romans 1 through 5 that will save your soul from hell. None of them. The only thing that has the ability to save your soul from hell is the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you want to look for salvation, you look for him and you look for him alone. You don't look for what George has done or Sheila or David or Bill. You don't look for what they have done in the flesh. Because by the way, God says, once you're saved, it's no longer you who live, but I who live in you, Galatians 2.20. So why would you be looking for your own fruit to show you that you're saved? People don't, we shouldn't look to walk or actions to determine salvation. You know, there are some people that have a better walk than, there are some lost people that have a better walk than Christians. I always admired my grandfather. He was a good man. He was an honest man. He was always helping other people. He did some things I never understood. You know, just growing up in the mountains of Kentucky and the things that he did uh, just amazed me what we've lost in, in our generations. But he was not a saved man, and he didn't want to hear about it. He wouldn't let anybody talk to him about spiritual things. But you know what? He lived a better life. He walked a better life, you know, what you would look at on the surface, than many saved people I knew. Now, thankfully, I shared the gospel with my grandfather. He, he had a soft place for me in his heart. And so... His wife couldn't talk to him, my grandmother. His children couldn't talk to him. But his only grandson, well, I was his only grandson for 13 or 14 years. He would let me talk to him. And thankfully, I do believe he trusted the gospel before he died. But you don't look to people's walk to know if they are saved. If the way you live your life can't save you, then you need to think about, are you going to trust in the way you live your life to keep you saved? So when, once you understand salvation, then you need to understand, what is it that's going to keep you saved? If people can put you back under the law, put you under a performance-based system to determine your standing before God, what is going to happen when you do something you're not supposed to, to, to do? You're going to feel condemnation, right? It's going to create doubt, it's going to create fear in your mind. Am I really saved? You know, because Paul says those people, they try to put you back under the law because they like to make a, share, a fair show in the flesh. You know, those Pharisees really like to make a fair show in the flesh. Those were the law guys, right? Look at how great I am in the flesh. And then you come along and you say, I'm just a miserable sinner saved by grace. And they say, they don't like that. They say, but look at all these good works that you should be doing. So anyways, my point is, is when they try to pull you back under the law, they try to instill that doubt and fear. And if the adversary can get you to that point, you've lost that foundation, right? You've lost what Paul is trying to establish you on. He's trying to establish you so that you can't be moved off of that. But if that's the primary thing, what do you think the adversary is going to focus the most on? Look, if you want to know what your enemy is doing, look at where the battle is raging the, the fiercest, right? Look at the most important points of the battle. You know, when, when, uh, when Hitler invaded Stalin's Russia, Stalin wasn't looking over to the East Coast over by Japan to see what Hitler was doing. He knew where to look. We should know where to look. We know that this is the primary issue, so this is what we're going to have to fight. So Romans is vital when it comes to the issue of understanding your salvation and what it requires. Um, when Paul comes to verses 11 and 12, of Romans chapter number one, where he wants to establish them, the first thing Paul is wanting, the information that he's wanting to provide to them is he's wanting them to understand this body of information that's been revealed to him from the Lord Jesus 
Christ from heaven. Look over at Romans chapter number three. Romans chapter number three. You know, salvation by grace alone through faith alone could be hard for a Jew to understand, right? Who has been brought up under the law. This is something that's new to them. And so it's, it's something that would be difficult to those who were of the circumcision, who had a covenant relationship and had to keep the law in order to be saved. So Paul writes the first, uh, these first chapters to prove justification by faith. And there are certain words that, he's, that he uses. As he goes through, I told you Romans 3 so you can stay there, but he uses a few types of words that I want you to notice. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 24. I just want you to look at the first verse of how that verse starts. He says, wherefore. Now, if someone is using the word wherefore, I just want you to think for a minute, what are they doing? Aren't they getting to the point where they have a conclusion? You know, um, uh, hey, hey, Joyce, um, I shoveled your driveway, all the snow, wherefore it's time for you to pay me, right? You know, <laughs> I'm saying something and then wherefore draws the conclusion. This is what I've said, wherefore, because of this, this is the next step. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. He says, therefore. Verse number 26, therefore. Chapter 3, verse number 20. He says, therefore, verse number 28, therefore, as Paul goes through these beginning chapters of Romans, he's, I don't want you to think, this is, Romans is not all over the place, okay? You know, chapter one is not over here and two over here. Does, is Paul saying different things? Yes, but they're all built to, to build logically on this issue of salvation. So that way when he comes to verse number 16 of chapter number one, and he says, I'm ready to preach the gospel. And now he's going to go through and tell you how it's the power of God and why that's important. Because it's the power of God. Notice what he says back in chapter number one. <clears throat> verse number 17, and I might be getting ahead of myself. But he says in verse number 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Where is the, the righteousness of God revealed? Verse number 16, the gospel of Christ. And in the gospel of Christ, verse number 17 says, For, because of that, for, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Why is the righteousness of God being revealed important, Paul? Well, what does he go on to say just a few verses later? That the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. So if you want to avoid the wrath of God, what do you need? Righteousness. Paul says it's the gospel of Christ where that righteousness is revealed. So, all of these things, he says, four, four, four. Look, you, you know, if you just scroll your, your eyes down there, Romans chapter 1, you know, verse 16, four. Verse 17, four. Verse 18, four. Verse 20, four. Um, you go over to chapter number 2. He, he uses the word four again several times. Ch uh, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, verse 14. You see how Paul is, is, Paul is building something here. And he's pointing this point out, and then we're going to put something on top of that, and something on top of that, and something on top of that. So by the time we get to the concluding point, you can't say, well, no, 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 I don't agree with your conclusion. <laughs> Paul's already put you into a corner, slap, bang, right there you are, you can't get out. He's just laid it down, and you, you, there's no arguing with it. So he says, and look at chapter 3 and verse number 28. One of the culminating points here. He uses the word therefore. Okay? So now based upon everything he's just said, therefore, verse 28, we conclude, here's the conclusion of everything I've just said, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. I hope you don't take for granted how important that is. 
I hope you grow, have grown up in a system under grace where you've never known what it's like to be under a system of law and condemnation. I hope from the moment that you got saved that you understood salvation and you were in a church that taught the grace of God properly and rightly. I, I, I hope that that's the case. And if it is, the next thing I hope is that you don't take that for granted. Because there are a lot of people out there that are in churches and in denominations where they're not teaching the truth of God and they're not teaching that therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. You know what the difference is? The difference is Israel being a slave down in Egypt versus Israel being free under Solomon and knowing peace and prosperity. That's the difference. Do you want to be a slave to the law that comes along and beats you down and says you're not good enough? You can never do it? You know, <laughs> Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan, the Moses comes along and what does he do? Whack! Hits the guy, nails him down. Guy never even saw it coming. He's like, who is that? And the guy said, that was Moses. Without the deeds of the law. Now, as Paul uses those words, he's building the argument for, for, wherefore, therefore. And when we get to chapter number five, Paul has established this. And so he says in chapter five and verse number one, therefore... Go back to, look at verse number 25 just to, to see a bit of the buildup there. Chapter 4, verse 25. Who was delivered for our offenses. There's the part that Christ died for our sins. And was raised again for our justification. So that way when we talk about the gospel, we call it the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why do you include all three? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, they include all three parts of that. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. When Paul says, this is the gospel that I preached unto you. And he says here in verse number 25, that Christ was delivered for our sins, for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. If Christ be not raised, what is our faith? It's in vain. Let's pack up and go home, shut off the lights, and never come back. So then he says, with that in mind, and he's built the argument, and he says in chapter 5 and verse number 1, Therefore, now before I read this, think back to chapter number 1 and verses that we haven't read yet. So you don't have the context in your mind. But in chapter number one, where Paul says that the gospel of Christ, that this is where the righteousness of God is revealed. And he says that the wrath of God is, is going to be poured out against unrighteousness. So if you have righteousness, you have a good standing with God. You have peace with God. But if you don't have his righteousness, if you're not saved and you're still in your sins, you're in unrighteousness. And therefore, because of that, you don't have peace with God. So he gets down to chapter 5 and verse 1. He says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. The wrath that was talked about that's being poured out upon the unrighteousness it's not set aside for us. And so, you know, one of those doctrinal issues that you could get into and study in more depth after you get past salvation is the issue of the wrath of God being poured out during the tribulation period. And the, the theologians argue, are we going to be here? Are we not going to be here? And why is there so much debate over the matter? There's so much debate because people don't understand that there's a difference between Israel and the body of Christ, and that they put, they take the whole book, and they see that there's going to be people who are going, there's going to be God's people who are going to go through the wrath, and so therefore, because they think that the church, the body of Christ, has replaced Israel, they think, that's us, we're going to go through the wrath. 
but those of us who see the distinction and Paul's distinctive ministry and this information here, and we look to say, okay, Paul is saying Israel is now set aside and that God is going to return to Israel and fulfill the promises that he made to Israel. By the way, what did he promise Israel? A kingdom. <laughs> Why would you go through the wrath to get the kingdom that was never promised to you in the first place? You see, you don't have to go through the wrath because you're not appointed under wrath, the book of Thessalonians tells us. And just understanding your salvation here and getting your salvation right will help you in those later doctrinal matters. When you say, well, if the wrath is going to be poured out against the unrighteousness of God, I am not appointed under wrath, I have peace with God. I'm not going to be here. So you come over to Thessalonians and it talks about us being caught away and you say, yes, that's consistent with what Paul is saying back in Romans about my status before God. I don't have to go through the wrath. And then when you find out that the wrath is called the time of Jacob's trouble, and you say, okay, Jacob is Israel, and it's Israel's trouble, that's his trouble, not mine. So, I just make the point that it's important to understand these foundational issues. I'll just make a few more statements here, and then we'll close. After Paul has argued and provided justification by faith alone, apart from works in the law, there's something that comes as a result. And what, that co what comes as a result is this peace with God that we have that can reign in our hearts. You know, when Paul talks about the peace that passes under, passeth understanding, we can know what that peace is if Christ's life is being lived out through me and, I, and I'm established in the right doc, uh, doctrine and I know that I'm good with God, that I have a right standing before God, righteousness. If I know I have that right standing with God, then what is it spiritually that can attack me in this world that can move me off of my peace with God? Nothing, because I know that nobody can take it away from me. Nobody. That's what the end of Romans chapter 8 is talking about. When it tells you nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So if you have peace with God, that also tells you something about how God works today. So I said again, these found, this foundational issue of your justification and salvation will help you understand other doctrinal matters. So we get into the issue of chastening. How does God work today when you do something, when you do something wrong and you do something that you shouldn't have? Are you then fearful that God is going to seek for a reprisal and He's going to come out and He's going to punish you and do something physically to you? Um, that's not what... That's, that's not what God is doing because what? You have peace with God. You have a right standing with Him. If God is not imputing your sin against you, then guess what? He's not mad at you. If God can't impute your sin to you, why would God be mad at you? Think about that for a second. You're just before Him. You don't need to re re repent of your shortcomings. You rejoice in Christ and what He's done for you. You rejoice in your position that you have. It's a privileged position. It's too good to be true, but I believe it's true. <laughs> so you just notice the connection between justification, justice, righteousness, peace. The struggles that are going on in our world today justice, peace, it's nothing new. And they only make sense when viewed through a Christian worldview. These issues only make sense when it's understood that there is a righteous standard and there is such a thing as justice and it flows from God. And we stand before Him. And the question is, do we have a right standing before Him or do we have a not right standing before him, an unright standing, an unrighteous standing. You don't want to have an unrighteous standing because then the wrath of God will be poured out upon you. And that's not, you know, the place that you want to live, that's not a position you want to be in, never knowing when that wrath might fall. And so 
we're encouraged by the position that we have, and then that's a motivating factor for us to share the gospel. That's why Christians have been missionaries and go out and preach the gospel. It's because we don't want people to go through that wrath. We want people to have a right standing before God. And by the way, we're not going out seeking to build God's kingdom. God will build His kingdom. We're going out to see souls saved so that way they have peace with God because they obtain God's righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're thankful for the, the simpleness of your salvation and the wonderful truths that are contained in your word. And we're so excited to be looking at the book of Romans, which, which tells us these things. And may we never become disinterested in simple things that are so profound. In simple things that have changed our lives, given us eternity in our hearts and has shed your love toward us. We're thankful for your Son, Father, who makes all of these things possible. We're thankful that you purposed to do these things in Him before the world began. We're thankful, Lord, that you saw fit to include us in that purpose and that you've extended your grace and mercy to us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.